it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. How are you? I was going to tell you a joke about three people, white, black and brown, walking into a bar and um, being greeted by an Asian person. But in all honesty, uh, some of the serious things look like jokes right now and some of the jokes look kind of serious so instead of that here is what i want to start this volume out with i did a lot of research into factory farming uh, the meat industry and sustainable food practices for this volume a lot of that research gathered have been from peer-reviewed journals amongst other places but here's the surprising thing but here's the thing that surprised me the most even those peer-reviewed journals uh, were written by scientists that have been funded in part by the meat industry. So it is important for you to know that information about this subject is tainted and the context is super important. Also, please do me a favor and leave me a good review and rating on iTunes or Stitcher. Say nice things. Uh, I realize that I could use some love on the platforms and a review and rating helps us be found by other people so please send us some love that would be cool today's guest is the co-founder of a company called fable who have partnered with harris farm and woolworth stores around australia for their plant-based meat alternative product mainly made of mushrooms not only that, they have a deal with the meal company Marley Spoon and their products are served on the menu of Melbourne's two-hatted restaurant, Dinner by Heston. Yes, that is the same legendary chef, Heston Blumenthal. He is an investor. Today's guest name is Michael Fox. Michael Fox is a legend in the entrepreneurial space. So I started by asking him what healthy looks like to him. The World Health Organization has said that um, processed meats like sausages and salami are, uh, are carcinogenic and red meat is very likely carcinogenic. Um, and yeah, as we kind of touched on before, you don't get bowel cancer if you, if you eat a plant-based diet. Um, so the meats that we're trying to replicate aren't good for you, in, in any, certainly not in anything like the quantities that we eat them. So it depends on what your goal is with the level of processing but if your goal is to be healthy then they're like you know th this is definitely healthier for you than uh than eating 110 kilograms of of animal meat every year um then secondly so so if i walk into woolworths or coles it's like three quarters of that supermarket is processed food it's a very small percentage of the supermarket it's probably less than 20 percent is actually fresh food on that scale of oreo to banana i've wanted to develop fable as close to banana as possible um, but my mission is to end industrial animal agriculture. Um, I'm not going to do that by serving people fresh shiitake mushrooms, um, but if I can do that by moving up the scale slightly and turning shiitake mushrooms, still keeping all the goodness of them in there using other really natural, minimally processed and plant-based ingredients, but just move up the scale a fraction up from banana and then produce something that tastes like meat, um, that's what's going to help achieve the mission. And, and overall, you know, it's not... In a perfect world, everyone would just eat shiitake mushrooms instead of meat, but but that's that's not reality. So this is this is the I think striking the right balance. In today's volume, we go into the psychology of consumer behavior, highlighting the issues with industrial animal agriculture. For context, according to Wikipedia. I suppose if most of us are getting our news from Facebook and Instagram, then definitions on Wikipedia are what someone would search for first or find first. So here's a definition. Intensive animal farming or industrial livestock production 
also known by its opponents as factory farming, is a type of intensive agriculture, specifically an approach to animal husbandry designed to maximize production while minimizing costs. In that definition, there are two references. The first reference is to the word factory farming, and the second is to the whole definition as a whole. Ready? The second definition references a Forbes article titled, Why Factory Farming Isn't What You Think. This article goes into some numbers of what constitutes a healthy factory farm and why we can consider a middle ground and not the far extreme versions of what we see when PETA, or any other charity, social enterprise, call it what you want, needs to get your attention. The first reference to the words factory farming leads me to a New York Times opinion article titled Why Industrial Farms Are Good for the Environment. Do your own research and see all sides before deciding where on the scale of conservative to liberal you are based on any topic you are considering, I suppose. So everything has a backstory and like most entrepreneurs, the journey helps give context for the information you're about to consume. With Shoes of Prey, we um, uh, we messed up our market research, um, basically. Like, So we, we had initially done really well in this niche of creative customers who were passionate about designing their own shoes. Um, we had lots of mass market customers coming to our website um, and they were exploring designing their own shoes, but they just weren't buying. So we did a whole bunch of market research, like we did surveys, uh, focus groups, uh, interviews with those mass market customers to understand why you're coming to our website and why you're not buying basically and what would it take to get you to design your own shoes and the mass market customer basically explained that they wanted they love the concept that's why they're coming to the site they really wanted to design their own shoes um, but we needed to do three things we needed to speed up our delivery times we needed to not charge a premium for customization um, and we needed to simplify the shoe design experience so um, we went out and ex raised a bunch of capital and uh, built our own shoe factory, hired software engineers to simplify the shoe design experience with our own shoe factory. We um, sped up the lead time for designing your shoes and, and receiving them. Uh, and we lowered the unit costs so we could lower the retail price. So we delivered the value proposition that the mass market customer told us she wanted and that, that we drew out through our market research. But ultimately, we didn't. We grew sort of. We kind of five x the size of the business, but we should have grown much, much more if the value proposition was resonating. We built the value proposition so we could now watch how consumers behaved on our website, and what we saw when we watched their behaviour was that this mass market customer really didn't want to customise. She kind of struggled with the design process. She really just wanted to be told what to wear. She wanted to see what's popular on Instagram and in fashion magazines and buy that exact design that is designers put together um, and even buy that exact brand. And this wasn't something that she could, that she was conscious of. So when, when we asked her, she, she told us she wanted to design her own shoes and she gave the reasons why. Um, so consciously she thought she wanted to customize, but deep down subconsciously she didn't want to do it. Um, and it. And it was subconscious, so she couldn't actually explain why. Um, and in any kind of decision making, your subconscious is more powerful than your your conscious. Um, so yeah, the value proposition we built just didn't resonate with mass market customers, and you know that that resulted in us basically closing Shoes of Prey down, um, not returning thirty five million dollars to our investors, and having to lay off the two hundred people that we'd employed. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, quote: Investors have lost millions in the collapse of cult fashion startup. Shoes of Prey, which went into liquidation on Monday, the 11th of March, 2019. Shoes of Prey received a multi-million dollar funding injection in March 2018 from the troubled Blue Sky Alternative Investments and US fund Greycroft Partners, but paused its business a few months later. High-profile investors included Atlassian co-founder Mike Cannon Brooks, Blackbird Ventures, Kosla. Ventures and high-end American retailer Nordstrom, which opened Shoes of Prey design centers in some of its stores. The concept was to enable shoppers to customize shoes online and have them delivered in weeks. End quote. 
with all that history, I bet Michael had some advice for himself and you if you are starting all over again. I'd probably start from a place of listening and I'd try and step all the way back. So in the example of designing your own shoes, I'd probably step back and ask a customer, like when you're shopping, talk me through the experience of the, the last time you bought a pair of shoes and then just listen and get them to explain, you know, and then, then draw out, you know, you might want to draw out things like, you know, what prompted them to decide to buy a pair of shoes, you know, was it an event that they were going, uh, wanted to wear them at or, or something else. But, but really actually just ask, like, I'd start with really kind of zoomed out questions and listen to what the customer says uh, and then sort of probe into the areas that, that I wanted to probe into. But, yeah, I'd, I'd start from a place of doing a lot of listening. American financer Bernard Baruch once said, some of the most successful people I've known are the ones who do more listening than talking. Okay, what about advice for any one of us who has a business idea and is about to invest time, money, and effort into it? If you have a business idea, ideally you can find something close or something similar that customers are already doing and go and watch their behavior. Uh, That's not always possible. Like with Shoes of Prey, it wasn't possible because that value proposition didn't exist. Um, But with Fable, it is possible because there are other meat alternatives. So so yeah, in my experience, the ideal scenario is if you can go and watch how customers are behaving in a similar scenario. Um, if you can't do that, um, then yeah, you do need to talk to customers and and get some intuition going yourself. But I think the mistake, the learning for me out of Shoes of Prey was to really delve down and ask deep questions. Like if if you hear what you want to hear, um, don't don't get excited and take don't necessarily get excited and take that at face value. Um, try to delve into really understanding the psychology and the reasoning, um, ask sort of deep probing questions uh, to try and understand the background. And it's still hard. Like I still don't even know how he's there, if that would have been possible to do with Shoes of Play, but we definitely could have done it better. Could have done it better. Could have done it better. Okay, so the psychology of everything is kind of important because lots of companies are spending lots of money and time trying to create the next thing for you to consume. But let's talk about Fable. How healthy is it really for you? I sometimes think about it on a scale of like banana to Oreo, an Oreo being a highly processed food, a banana being a fresh food. So yeah, everything can kind of sit on a processing scale like that. Um, so we aim with Fable to sit much closer to banana than, than an Oreo. Um, so our product is 62% shiitake mushroom. Um, so shiitake mushroom is our base ingredient. And we do we do very little processing on that shiitake mushroom. We keep, keep as many of the nutrients and minerals and everything in the shiitake mushroom. Um, and, and shiitake mushrooms are incredibly healthy food that we should be eating more of. You know, for thousands of years, they've been used in Chinese medicine, um, Western science has caught up with all of this. That they're really high in fiber. Um, they're, they're great sources of vitamin D and and iron as well. Uh, even vitamin B12 and some of the other harder to get B vitamins. Um, so we use shiitake mushroom as our base ingredient. Um, and then our, our other ingredients, are, we only use natural ingredients. There's nothing artificial in them. Um, and yeah, it's a, just a short list of of all natural plant based ingredients. So. You know, we could, people could buy, just go and buy a fresh shiitake mushroom and that, that would be the equivalent of eating a banana. Um, and I hope people do that because shiitake mushrooms are delicious. But, you know, people, we've evolved to love the taste and texture of meat and a shiitake mushroom isn't quite the same as meat. Um, and so what we've done is in as minimally a processed way as possible, we've basically taken the shiitake mushroom and turned it into something that tastes like pulled pork or braised beef or beef brisket. Um, so you get that delicious taste and texture um, while still getting a really minimally processed, all-natural, healthy product. Okay. And did you apply the learnings and the psychology of behavior from Shoes of Prey to Fable? My learning out of that experience is that asking customers what they want um, is fraught with all sorts of challenges. Often the customer will tell you what they think that you want to hear or they don't actually really know what they want because what's in their conscious mind is different to their subconscious mind. So the way I've applied those learnings with Fable is um, it's much better to watch how consumers behave. Um, and in this category of, um, of meat alternatives, 
Uh, there are other meat alternatives on the shelf in Woolworths and Coles. So I can literally go into the supermarket, watch how customers are shopping that, that range of products. I can see which products they pick up and put back on the shelf. And then I can see which ones they pick up and put in their shopping basket. Um, and then I can go and ask them, you know, why did you, why did you not buy that one? Um, and what was it that made you buy this one that, that you're purchasing? Um, and so you can actually see how they behave and then ask them questions to understand that behavior as opposed to just asking questions without watching their behavior. Yesterday, I made a coconut cream curry with potatoes and Fable's plant-based braised beef product. And I have to say that it got swiped. Rochelle and I ate it for lunch and then finished it for dinner. You can get Fable in restaurants and in stores if you go to fablefood.co slash where, W-H-E-R-E. It'll give you options of where you can uh, find Fable based on where you are located. When we come back, the real reason why incorporating and adding some of these meat alternatives to your diet is good, not just for the planet, but could save you from dealing with some fundamental health issues. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Okay. Let's break some of this down. It's obvious that Fable exists for reasons way beyond it being a good product. Mike, break it down for us. From an environmental perspective, um, that just kind of blew my mind as I delved into this space and learned more about that. So, um, and these are are UN um, agriculture figures. Um, 47% of the world's habitable landmass is devoted to animal agriculture. 47%, like nearly half of the world's habitable landmass. And when I first read that figure, it like didn't make sense. Like, sure, surely not. That doesn't make sense. I haven't seen that many animals around the place. Um, but the reason is it's kind of two main reasons. So, firstly, a lot of um, land is used for grazed animals. Um, and grazed animals are an, an incredibly inefficient way to produce food. Like you've got to have a huge amount of space for one cow to be able to graze and eat grass. Um, you know, if the world only ate um, grazed meat, we'd need a, we'd need multiple planets to feed every feed everybody. There's just not enough space to do that. Um, and then the second re- big reason is um, all the factory farmed animals have to have crops grown for them. And this blew my mind. More than half of the world's crops that are grown aren't fed directly to humans, they're fed to animals. So more than half of you drive past fields, you know, crop fields, more than half of those are actually being fed to animals. And this is also incredibly inefficient. So the average pig, for example, needs to eat eight kilograms of plant matter to produce one kilogram of pork. So you, you, you've got an 8x loss uh, at, at that point where, you, where you've got to feed the animal all, all these plants. So if we just ate the plants directly, um, we could save eight times the amount of crops that would need to be grown. We could save eight, to, would use one eighth the amount of land. Um, and we could actually, if, we, if no one ate animal meat and we all ate plants instead, we could reforest about 30% of the world's habitable landmass. Um, and if we reforested all of that or, or revegetated all of that, it would be a huge carbon sink that would go and capture a whole bunch of the carbon that we've put in the atmosphere. Um, there's a report, uh, it's called Rethink X, which delves into this a little bit. Um, and out of that report, they said if, if North America stopped eating animal meat, um, you could reforest over a third of the North American landmass and without any re- carbon reduction, in, without any reduction in carbon emissions, North America would be um, carbon neutral. 
just from all of the carbon that would be captured by reforesting that much space. Not to mention the fact that in animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so, you know, in addition to all the land that gets cleared, animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% 14, 14 of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. So it's more than all of transport combined. So we could electrify all of the cars, ships, planes in the world, and that wouldn't have as big an impact on emissions as if we just stopped eating meat. Um, so reducing your meat consumption or, or even better, stopping your meat consumption is one of the biggest things we can do as individuals to lower our carbon emissions. Going vegan or vegetarian isn't as simple as understanding the impact that making that change is going to make. As J.C. Reese Anthes starts his TED Talk by saying. Before we dive in, I want to ask a couple questions. First, how many of you are vegetarian or vegan? Okay, a few, around maybe 5%. If we asked all U.S. adults, it'd be around five, maybe 10%. Now, how many of you have seen at least one of the following? A video of animal cruelty on factory farms, a documentary or news report on the environmental harms of animal agriculture, or a scientific article on the public health issues, such as the overuse of antibiotics in animal feed? How many? Okay, almost everyone, probably over 95%. Now, when I see that jump from 5%, I worry that I've made a huge mistake. Full disclosure, I'm a vegan. <laughs> I'm even the preachy vegan who tells everyone I meet about the problems of animal farming because I really do think it's one of the most important issues of our time. But my mistake, and the mistake of other food advocates, has been trying to fix these issues solely by telling you personally to go vegan, vegetarian, or to reduce your meat consumption. We need a bigger, better solution for our broken food system. He also goes on to say this bit. Unfortunately, according to USDA data, over 99% of farmed animals live on factory farms. The situation is dire. There are over 100 billion animals in the global food system. Many of them are confined in tiny cages, barely larger than their own bodies. Their beaks and tails are cut off without anesthetic. They suffer day and night from infectious diseases an intense artificial selection that has them growing so much meat that they collapse under their own weight. So I guess the question is, how did we get here? And what is really happening? I guess it's a combination of things. Like um, it's just, yeah, straight up capitalism. People want to eat meat and they want to um, pay as little for it as possible. Um, and so... Yeah, so then businesses do what businesses do and they try to work out ways to produce the highest volume of meat at the cheapest price. Um, and that's sort of happened over, particularly over the last sort of 40, 50 years, that's really built up to the point where we now have um, factory farms where animals live, uh, you know, that we've bred the gen genetics of the animals so that they grow as quickly as possible. Um, we put them in environments where we speed up using light and, and artificial light and, and darkness we sort of speed up the number of days sort of shorten the day for the animals that kind of impacts their hormones and makes them grow more quickly we feed them food to speed up their growth um, we cram them in a small space to keep it uh, keep the cost down and then we have to feed them antibiotics because if we don't they'll they'll all die um, because they've got so many animals crammed in a small space lots of disease can spread easily um, and then we, the consumer doesn't want to see any of this because it is genuinely horrible. Um, and so we hide all of that so that the, we, we're not transparent with any of it. So the end consumer, all the end consumer sees is they walk into the supermarket, there's a beautifully packaged piece of meat, there's a picture of a smiling farmer and a happy looking cow, um, and we can sort of, ignorance is bliss, we can go pick up that meat to, at a great price and take it home and cook with it. We kind of sh shut our eyes to the to what actually goes on to produce the meat and industry doesn't want you to see that because uh, it'll put you off buying the meat so they do everything they can to you know not be transparent with the process and and to sort of paint a nice picture over the top of it of uh, which isn't the reality of what actually happens Foodprint wrote an interesting article on antibiotics within the food system showing research by the FDA stating that more than 20 million pounds of medically imported antibiotic drugs were sold for use on livestock farms in 2014. 
This was about 80% of all antibiotics sold. Because of the growth advantage of non-therapeutic antibiotics, which are those that are used for purposes other than treating disease, these were routinely given to livestock, poultry and fish on industrial farms until the FDA effectively banned the practice in 2017. So seven years ago, I started a food podcast called the Bond Appetite Podcast. It was around our relationships with food and what our memories around food were growing up. I've interviewed a lot of people around the topic of food, especially about the accepted notion that our food gets governed by the Department of Industries rather than the Department of Health. And if that's the case, which it is, by definition, any industry is focused on streamlining production so that it maximizes profit. So you get your meat from the meat industry. There's a lot of vested interests in maintaining the status quo. You know, there's a lot of large meat businesses. Um, meat is a more than trillion dollar industry. It makes up about 8% of global GDP. Um, so it's a, it's a massive, massive industry. And yeah, you've got all of the existing companies and players in that space that, um, you know, are making good money they don't want their businesses to be disrupted um and so uh yeah so those those companies will do what companies do and will you know fight to keep their consumers and keep producing their products um but yeah hopefully the you know hopefully there's the shift comes from a couple of different angles um and in my mind it's going to come from you know consumers who want to reduce their meat consumption like getting consumers getting more of an understanding of the negative health impacts of eating too much meat. Just take, for example, bowel cancer. If you eat a plant-based diet, you just don't get bowel cancer. Bowel cancer is caused by meat uh, and the, particularly the quantities of meat that we're eating in society today. And I think bowel cancer is like the third most common cancer in, a, in Australia and the United States, something crazy like that. And it literally, you just don't get it if you eat a plant-based diet. And there's a whole bunch of other things like that that are, that are caused by um, eating eating too much meat that you don't get if you eat a plant-based diet then there's all the environmental reasons which we've talked through and all of the ethical reasons as well so i think there's a big there is already a big consumer trend towards reducing meat consumption and hopefully that continues to grow but even just taking a purely capitalistic approach like our goal with fable is to produce a product that tastes at least as good if not better than meat and we'll keep improving the product and until it is how it does have a better taste and texture than animal meat. And we can keep improving this product, whereas a cow, unless you're going to go and genetically engineer the cow, you're not going to be able to change the taste of beef too dramatically, whereas our product, we can keep improving it. So if we can make a product that tastes better than animal meat, we, we are all, we're launching into Woolworths in three weeks' time, um, and we're launching a 250-gram pack of our plant-based slow-braised meat for $8.50. Um, that's exactly the same pack size and retail price as a pulled beef product that's in Woolworths. So you can go, go buy 250 grams of pulled beef for $8.50 or you can buy the Fable version for, for uh, 250 grams for $8.50. So same pack size, same price. And that's before we've even scaled. So once we're at scale, we're going to be able to offer our products cheaper than animal meat. Um, and that's because our, it's just more efficient to produce. Like we don't have to have a whole bunch of land for a cow to graze on or we don't have to feed a pig eight kilograms of plants to get one kilogram of pork. You know, we've got pretty close to a one-to-one -one conversion ratio on our inputs to end products. So plant-based meats are going to be cheaper to produce than animal meat pretty soon. So you end, if we end up with a, and this is our goal, end up with a product that tastes better than animal meat and is cheaper than animal meat, even someone who's a diehard meat eater is going to find it pretty tough to go and buy an inferior product at a higher price, um, even if they don't care that it's made from animals, even if they prefer that it's made from animals. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's our goal with Fable, and and I think that's gonna that's gonna happen. You know, it's not just us. There's lots of other plant-based companies aiming to do the same thing, and I think fast forward 20 years' time, most of the meat we eat will no longer come from animals. I think this is inevitable. It's it's going to happen, um, and yeah, we want to we want to help that to happen. After yesterday's fable food coma, I can say that we will be using more plant based options for sure. But it's easy to get caught up in ideals when you realize that all our ideals make up our view of the world, especially if you're an entrepreneur. Yeah, you, you, you can get caught in a trap of like, oh my God, the world's terrible. There are so many problems that need fixing. 
on the flip side, um, there are amazing things about our society and, you know, capitalism for, you know, all its uh, ills of creating factory farming. Capitalism is also an amazing system for organising humans and, you know, it's brought billions of people out of poverty. Um, you know, there's a, there's a really amazing graph of the number of people living in dire poverty and it's at we're at the lowest it's today we're at the lowest that that figure has ever been um throughout the history of humanity um and and a lot of that's happened even in the last 30 years with industrialization in countries like china and and other places so um you know there's a lot of amazing things about our society and about our world um and and i actually think it's it's an incredible opportunity for us to flip some of these things around i think we've done a lot of really good things a lot of people live really good um, happy lives, um, but there are still things to fix, um, and so yeah, I try and I try to keep a positive spin in in you know positive thought thoughts in my mind and look at some of those other really positive facts, but then go yeah then you can go and look at the areas that can still be improved and like you say um, yeah poverty, um, the fact that we have obese people and starving people in the world, sex trafficking, industrial animal agriculture, you know there's a um, global warming, there's a whole bunch of issues that we could still improve on. Um, and I guess what, in my experience, uh, having worked on a startup where I didn't think about those things, I was just doing it to build a business to make money versus working on a startup now where I'm deeply mission driven. Um, it has a huge impact on my life personally and my enjoyment of life. Like I'm thoroughly enjoying working on um, Fable every morning I wake up. It's just, it's the only thing I really want to do. I want to spend time with my kids, but second to that, um, working on this business is the is where I want to spend, you know, the other sort of 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Um, having that mission driving me um, is just, yeah, makes for a much more enjoyable life. So, so I, I, yeah, I guess I'd, I'd love to encourage more people to think about the problems in the world that, um, that you're inspired to want to go out and fix and then look for opportunities to, um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, look for opportunities to build a startup around that. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. I am a, a facilitator particularly around uh, Indigenous leadership or what's called intercultural leadership where you try to bring groups together. You end up carrying around the psychology of asking yourself an internal question, were they just being rude or were they being racist? Two things you shouldn't talk about at dinner is politics and religion. So I grew up and those two are the main things that they are the topics of conversation at dinner. Psychology of entrepreneurship. I interviewed Michael Fox because he is a serial entrepreneur and father that has lived and survived the entrepreneurial roller coaster. He has co founded it most notably. Shoes of Prey and Sneaking Duck. He is a mentor and investor in Startmate, which has invested in 110 plus startups with a combined valuation of over a billion plus dollars. He was a founding member of the National Online Retail Association in Australia. He is currently the co founder of Fable Food Co., that as of two weeks ago is available in 600 Woolworth stores around Australia. Fable launched with the endorsement and backing of chef Heston Blumenthal, as well as Grok Ventures and Blackbird Ventures. He is a father, entrepreneur, and solver of meaningful problems. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing, voiceovers, and sound design by Kelly Bunnyman and Tiago Vega. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Kelly Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivas. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. 
I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com.